Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll let Sami start on presenting the slide, if you got the rights. And if you have any questions and so on, don't hesitate to use the chat sessions. Uh, we are there to uh, answer directly in live and we can answer directly your questions. And maybe if you have some additional comments, idea, feedbacks, uh, we are more than eager to receive those. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. So let's see. Wow. Almost 80. I'm really surprised that we are so many today. It's great to see. I must say it's a bit intimidating, but it's good. That means that uh, there's some traction and uh, interest for that feature. Oops, I'm already spoiling my slides. Not good. Okay. Um, so I have the chat open. Uh, similar to, to the training that was uh, carried out this morning, uh, we like our training to be like interactive. So if you have any question at any point, as Alex mentioned, feel free to use the chat and we can discuss a bit live. Uh, and I think it's especially interesting for today because um, it's an introduction to our new feature called MISP workflows. And yeah, I, I guess many people that are there today are willing to know how to automate things. Uh, so let us know if you need something that can make your life easier with automation. But before we start, I actually have, similar to this morning, one simple question that I will ask to you. And to reply, you can just use like a thumb up or a raise and a reaction on the, the Zoom call is, um, have you already built automation around MISP? So by automation, I mean interacting with MISP in an automated way. So not with a human interacting with MISP. So if you wrote a script, uh, that do an API call if you are using the mixed workflow feature that is automation. Uh, yeah, just let us know so that we can see. So I see few few icons. Cool. So I see not many people have did it or they are shy people, uh, but it's good. So I think the the workflows are really a good introduction to 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 getting started in building automation. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone, to, for for, the, for your reply. So let's see first before diving into that uh, MISP workflow feature what we already have at our disposal to build automation. Uh, well, the first one is obvious, I think, uh, is by using the MISP API uh, or using PyMISP, which is the, the the Python client that you can have to interact with MISP. Um, yeah, so this one, I think, is the most straightforward. It's the one that has the most documentation and the most example, I think. Uh, and just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, if you are just getting started, I think having a look at this Jupyter notebook is a very good introduction on how you can interact with MISP using Python uh, and the PyMISP uh, library. So feel free to check it out. Um, but one of the issues that you have when you want to build automation uh, and especially workflows uh, in MISP using this uh, API uh, is if you have recurring tasks, uh, you need to put them in, cron, in a cron job. So it's not the end of the world, it's just a bit more work that you have to do. But depending on the task that you want to perform, it might also be heavy for the server, especially if you need to pull regularly your MISP instance uh, with complex queries. And last but not least, this is not real time. So if you want to be alerted that something happened, I don't know, uh, user logged in, uh, or uh, I don't know, a specific event with uh, a malicious uh, malware that you're tracking was created by someone, uh, you will not be alerted immediately because you, you would need that your script run. Uh, and this, this time can, depending on how you set it up, uh, it can take some time. So the second system that we introduced to, to have the access to this real-time functionality is by using the PubSub channels. So in MISP, you have two PubSub channels. We have uh, zero MQ uh, and Kafka. Uh, and well, this is very good because you get, if you subscribe to this channel, you get alerted immediately of anything that happened on MISP. 
Um, but the thing is, you cannot provide feedback to this. So if you if you see that something has been created, you cannot say, okay, or something is about to be published, you cannot prevent the publication to happen with these channels. Um, and in addition to that, it's a bit tougher to put in place because you have to, first of all, write some scripting, uh, but also make sure that you integrate correctly uh, with the format uh, that uh, Miss Pen uh, will send on, onto these channels. Um, so the, the main drawback of these two systems that we had already is that you cannot prevent default behavior to happen, uh, and it's tougher uh, to, to set up hooks that would execute specific action once something happened. So this is the main reason why we developed this feature is to tackle these two aspects. Uh, yeah, so these are some examples of things that users uh, would like to prevent um, when they're using this. An example could be prevent the publication of an event. So let's say that you are requiring your uh, users to have strong contextualization on the event. And if it's not uh, passing some contextualization sanity check, uh, you don't allow the event to be published. This is something that you can, this is an issue that you can address by using workflows. Uh, another example could be like, preventing query of third party services with sensitive information. And that point is very uh, interesting because this morning, I don't know if the guy that asked it uh, this morning is still there, uh, but someone asked for exactly that feature. So how can, uh, how is misbehaving uh, with uh, third party services queries with data that are marked with, for example, TLP red or uh, PAP Ember and PAP red. Uh, this is something that you can address by using these workflows. Um, yeah, other example for hooking that you can also do is to automatically run some enrichment services when something uh, is is uh, sh should be enriched. Uh, we'll see example on, for example, to to get DNS information of uh, uh, domain names and so on. Uh, something else, modify data on the fly. So if you detect that something is a false positive or that something is very likely to be uh, malicious, you can change the data so that it fits better in your CTI pipeline. Uh, something that is also cool, sending notification to chat room. So instead of receiving an email, you could set up MISP to send message to Matterboost, Slack, uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, stuff like that. Okay, so this was a good introduction of what you're trying to tackle. So why did we do do that in the first place? Well, it's because we are crazy about automation. We love things to to interact with machines and so on. Uh, and we wanted to empower users to really use our tool uh, in a more efficient manner. Uh, the how, you will see how we did it. Uh, basically, you have a, a UI interface where you can drag and drop modules, uh, link them together, enter condition, uh, and then try try this workflow uh, workflows out. Uh, something that is really interesting is the share workflows aspect. So we've designed a system that you will see uh, in the dozen of minutes that allows you to also share because in MISP everything is about sharing. So obviously you can also share your workflows. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, something that we've started to to like populate. So we have created a repository that holds some useful workflow that can, you can immediately use on your MISP instance. And for this one, uh, if you have already IDs or even if you have already workflow in place, I'm inviting you to share them with us so that it can it can benefit the entire community. And yeah, the community could, could even improve this workflow. So it's always good to, to share. Sharing is also about collaboration and giving feedback. So yeah. Okay, so what we are going to see today. Um, so this training, uh, it says that, uh, no, it doesn't say that it's a workshop that is good because it will be mainly about presentation. So I will be mainly presenting the feature, explaining how to do things, uh, show you, showing some examples, uh, using the system live. And at the end, we'll show how you can extend that, uh, that uh, functionality to, well, that feature to add more functionality. 
So a bit of fundamentals, the annoying part that we try to make it a bit uh, entertaining. So how does that work? Uh, this is how I like to see to see it to, to see it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. At the start, you have something that happens. So an event. It's not like a misp event where you can encode attributes and so on. No, it's just a generic event. So an action happen. Uh, then you can have optional condition that have to be satisfied or not. And depending on the result of this condition, you can have some action that can be executed. An example would be uh, to uh, actually have example on the, the, the next slide, but uh, action can also prevent the original event that was there to happen. So what kind of event are we talking about? Uh, if a new misp event is created, this time I'm talking about the actual container of information. If an attribute uh, is saved, if a new discussion post has been started, if a new user is created, if a query again, a third party service is uh, being performed and so on. So all of these actions. Uh, but in misp, we have actions that do not run a workflow for the moment. Uh, what do we have? Um, trying to think about something. If you create a proposal, for example, or maybe this one is already covered. Anyway, some some action do not don't have a trigger associated to it. What I mean by that is, if an action can run a workflow, then we call it a trigger. So all of these are trigger. Um, but for example, user login, I, I'm almost sure this one uh, is not supported. So you cannot run a workflow once a user logged in. So we don't call this, this event a trigger. So basically, in MISP, a trigger is basically an, uh, an event that can run a workflow. And yeah, a trigger is always associated with one and only one workflow and the, the other way around. That means for a trigger, for example, a new MISP event, you can only have one workflow that would run for that event. And that workflow only has one trigger. So you cannot have two triggers in one workflow and uh, you can only have one workflow per trigger. So these are uh, the triggers that are currently supported in BISP. Uh, you can see I was wrong about proposals. So see when a new proposal is, is created, uh, we don't have uh, the possibility to run a workflow for that. So it is not currently a trigger. If you need it, let us know so that we can also add it. Uh, and it's also a good opportunity to also remind you that if you need something such as a new, uh, a new proposal uh, to be supported as a trigger, yeah, the chat is there for, for that. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, 10 triggers that can be hooked and on which you can create a workflow. And three of them are being blocking. So you can see on this column, blocking workflow. By blocking workflow, it means that you can block the original action, the original event to happen. So for example, we have event published there. It is a blocking workflow. That means you can decide to prevent the publication to happen. We have enrichment before query. You can see it's a blocking workflow. That means that you can prevent the enrichment to actually happen. And the last one is about user before save. So you see it's a blocking one. That means you can prevent a user to be saved on the database. Uh, see, an example for a non-blocking workflow would be the user after save. This one cannot is not blocking. That means you cannot block something that already happened. But you will see more details about that. So we had event, but we also have conditions. Uh, so what kind of condition are supported? For now, you can look at tag. You can look at distribution. You can look at uh, creator organization. These are things that are really misspecific. But in some cases, it might be tricky to to express things. For example, if you want to add some logic for user creation, user creation, they don't have, user don't have tags. 
they don't have a distribution. So for that, we need a more generic way to do that. And uh, to, to do that, we have created a generic way to express this condition uh, as it is shown. Uh, no, it's not this one, but I, I will show how, how that works later on. So when you create a condition in a workflow, we call them logic module. We call them module because as you can see on the screenshot, it's, it's like a module, you know, you can create uh, drag and drop this module on, 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 the, on the canvas, and then you can uh, link them together. You can chain them together. So you see, you have the entry point and you have the exit. So for this logic module, it's about distribution. And we check if the distribution of the event is set to this community. And then you can choose to either take this path, so the path where this condition is satisfied, or you can take the second path, which is the case if it's not the case, basically. OK. So what is currently available? So this is what you currently have at your disposal. Um, so we have some generic branching, so if else, uh, about distribution, tag, publishing, organization, the generic one. Uh, this one, we'll see that later on. And this one is just a blueprint. So yeah, logic modules, they can be used to redirect the flow. For example, for this one, you could say, OK, if it's if the distribution is this community, then send a message on this Mattermost channel. Otherwise, send an email to the site administrator. That's the thing you could do. And now, last but not least, actions. So for action, you can do, for example, sending an email, performing enrichment on the event, sending chat messages, attaching tags, so that means modifying data. Um, and similar to the logic modules, we call them action modules because it's a module. You can put it on the canvas and then you can link them and chain them if you want to execute one or more actions. So the one you have currently on the screen is the action module to send the mail. So you can set uh, the recipient for that mail. You can set the template, uh, the template of the subject of the mail and the body of that mail. And you can see data is coming from the left. Then the sending happened. And then on the right, you can perform more action if it's needed. And this is what you currently have uh, by default on your instance. Uh, so I already mentioned some of the action that you can do. Uh, you can run custom notification, you can run custom webhook, uh, you can add or remove tags, perform enrichment, and uh, yeah, stopping the execution. This is a special case. This stop execution module is the one that can uh, allows that allows you to block specific things to happen for blocking workflow. But we'll see that in practice. So I've been talking about workflow, but what is a workflow in MISP? Uh, well, the screenshot that you have on the screen is a workflow. It's basically the sequences of all connected nodes. Uh, so for this one on the left side, you have the trigger, so the event publish. Then this one is linked to a logic module, which check the distribution of the event. And then based on the satisfaction, it will take one of the two paths. If it's true, then it will stop the execution. So in this case, if we were to put this workflow and enable it on this, because you can obviously enable and disable workflows, um, this workflow would prevent any publishing of event that is lower uh, than the this community distribution setting, because the stop execution would prevent the event publishing to happen. So how would that work for this one? I think <laughs> we already saw how, we, how would it work, but let's uh, give it a run again. So if an event is about to be published, then the event publish trigger will start. So this one, it will start and the, the workflow will start its execution. Then some optional conditions are evaluated, similar to this one, and some action can be executed. So if, if it's a success, so if nothing happened, well, or if you send the mail and it was a success, then 
uh, you will have a log entry saying that the workflow executed and it was a success and life goes on. If it's a failure, so if you have an exception or if the workflow was blocked using this top execution module, then uh, for our publishing uh, trigger, event publish trigger, then the event will not be published and you will get a log entry stating why the, the publishing didn't happen. Okay, so let's quickly see. Okay, last slide. Blocking and non-blocking workflow. Uh, as I said, we have three that are blocking currently and seven because we only have 10 triggers for now that are not blocking. So for blocking workflow, you can prevent the original action to happen, such as publishing. And this is achievable thanks to the blocking module called stop execution. Uh, for non-blocking workflow, uh, the execution outcome has no impact. Uh, we had one, for example, with the user after save. If a user has been saved, then the workflow runs. But if it's a failure, or if you stop the execution, well, the user already has been saved. So there is nothing to do. There is no rollback. So there is no way to prevent something that already happened in the past. So that's stopped there. So that's why we have these two. And this icon, you can easily recognize them when you're editing your workflow to see, okay, can this workflow block the original action or not? Okay, so before checking the sources of the workflow module, let's check the chat if you have some question. Trigger to delete event after a particular time. Okay, this is a very interesting question because um, what we call trigger is actually something that can happen on MISP. So what you are requesting there is a trigger that executes after a particular time. But we don't have a particular time. It's not an action that can happen on MISP. So for that one, you would not use workflow for that. You would use uh, a script that you would put in a cron job that can do like uh, retention and some database cleaning. Uh, I would not put it as a trigger. Now you can create a workflow that can filter out some specific event uh, and then execute some webhooks to clean them, uh, but they need a starting point. And this is what these triggers are about. It's the starting point of a workflow. So it needs to be an action that happens some, at some point on this. A particular time, as you, as you phrased it, is not something that happened. I think the example that he gave, if I'm not misleading, was uh, feed update. So he was basically ingesting feeds, updating a MISP event, uh, and then publishing it. So my guess in this case, the trigger would be a publication of event. So that means when you republish an event after that you import it into the feeds, which usually happens when you import feeds, then uh, you would clean up this event based, for example, on uh, uh, decaying or things like that. So for example, older data, get removed there. Yeah, so what you mentioned with publishing, the publishing workflow will, will execute, but the data that is being passed from the publishing action to the workflow is only about this event. So if you want to publish this event, I mean, I guess it's because it has new information, so it doesn't need a cleanup. Uh, but I think it's, it's more it, the older attributes that are a specific threshold, for example, hmm. would be to be removed before doing the publish actions. So that the publish is triggered. So it won't be blocking. It's just that in any case, every time that there's a new feed imported, it's basically clean out based on a, I don't know, decaying okay. templates. Okay, so I see. So in this case, that would be something like uh, event after save or event after save new. Exactly. Yeah. That, that would like do some sanity checks on the attribute. And if this check doesn't pass, remove the attribute. That is something we could do. But you cannot like remove an event like this because that would need that you would need to run the workflow against all events. That means we, you would need to find a trigger that can ex execute on all events. Yeah, that means for, for, for this use case from Praveen, mm -hmm. that would be more like when they import the feed, it needs to mm -hmm. be a fixed event and then to basically being triggered like you, you were mentioning uh, specific publications. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that aspect, yes. So 
just talking about that, and we can immediately see we don't have a, a trigger dedicated to feed pool. We have one that says after save new, after save new from pool, but we don't have after save new or just after save from feed, from feed pool, let's say. So yeah, that's something that we could add if some people are interested. So let's go back. Okay, cool. That was a interesting discussion. <laughs> so sources of modules. Oops. So we have the triggers. So these ones. Oh. These ones, you cannot really like create anything out of it. These are developed by the Miss Project Development Team. So if you need something new, you have to let us know and we can add it. That's why we say that uh, it's MIP source core only. Uh, so this module can only come from the MIP source core, basically. Now for logic and action, it's a bit more special. You have access to all the logic and action module from the MIP source code, which are the one that you can see on the screen. This one, they are built in, they are shipped with the application out of the box. Uh, but you can also have customs that you can create or that you can use other services such as the miss module enrichment service to add more more of this module available uh, so for miss source code is built in uh, and custom uh, well you can write it in two places so let's let's have a look at what you can do so the default as i said are part of the miss code base uh, uh, for uh, like logic and action modules are part of the MISCOS bed as well. So tag operations, sending mails, stopping execution, webhook, and so on. Uh, it's like a buffet. You you go there, you use them, and and that's it. If you develop a new one, obviously get in touch with us, uh, share it, share the code with us, so that we can include it and everyone can benefit and provide improvement for that module. Um, but you can also define your own module. And I th think this is the most interesting part in that feature. Uh, you can create it. Uh, the first option that you have is to, well, use the programming language of the application, which is PHP. Uh, so if you want to define a new logic or action module, you can write it in PHP. Uh, I know it's not really, <laughs> let's say, super convenient for those who are not used to PHP. It's not really the most attractive programming language, uh, but it has some benefits. Uh, being that you can extend the already existing module. So for example, if you want to be more precise on tagging, well, you can just extend this one. Uh, to give another example, the Microsoft Team Webhook module is actually an extension from the Webhook module. This one is like four or five lines of code. So yeah, just to integrate, it's much easier if you use the heritage. Um, and you can also reuse code that is already in MISP. So if you need to do some special operation, uh, like enrichment or stuff like that, I mean, you have access to the whole MISP source code and you can use it right away. But I agree, it's not the most convenient way to do it. That's why we also added the possibility for you to do it in Python. Uh, so for that, we are using the MISP module enrichment service library. Uh, so obviously it's in Python. You can use any Python libraries that you have at your disposal. For example, the Mattermost module that we have is actually coming from the MISP module uh, repository and it's using the Mattermost uh, uh, Python library directly. Okay, so we have some demo by example send an email to all when a new event has been pulled. So let's see. Let's see. Okay. This is good. So to access the workflows, what you need to do is to go on administration and then workflows. Then you have the list of all triggers that you can uh, create a workflow for. So in our first use case, we want to send an email to all new, to, to all, 
to everyone on the instance when a new event has been pulled. By the way, <laughs> this doesn't add any new functionality to MISP because by default, when a new event is being published or pulled, uh, well, it sends, uh, MISP will send email notification about it. So we don't really add something new. But let's see how we could replicate that behavior using the workflow. So we need a new event. After save, event after save new, this seems like a good fit. So we would go there. Uh, obviously, it's my development instance. So let's take this one instead. It's already there, actually. Do we? Ah, we even talk about pool, so this is actually the correct one. Even after save new from pool, this is a very long name, but at least it tells you what it does. Uh, if you go back on the trigger index, you can also have a description of uh, of what, when, of when this uh, trigger is uh, executed. And so for this one, well, that that workflow does it. So when a new event is being pulled, it will send a mail. Uh, to all, to everyone, all accounts. Uh, and the subject of the template is miss notification new event pool. And the body of the email is the new event has been pulled. And you can see we have also the possibility to have interpolation of the data so that instead of having this, we, you would have the event info field instead. So it's basically a variable. So what I mean by pool is when you are synchronizing with other MISP instances, you can decide to push data to that instance, but also you can decide to pull data, so to fetch data and save it locally. This is what I called by pooling. So in this case, whenever you, your MISP instance initiate a pool synchronization, uh, it will fetch all events on the remote side, save them locally, and execute this workflow for each event that that, uh, that have been saved from that pool. Okay, so what is the second use case? To block queries on third party services when the TLP red or, what is the or, PP red tag are applied. So we have a small reminder of what these two tags are. So TLP red means for the eyes and ears of individual recipient only. And PUP red means only passive actions that are not detectable from the outside. So for that, what we want to have is to have to block queries on third party services. And for that, we have enrichment before query. And it says this trigger is called just before a query against the enrichment service is done. So let's open it up. And ooh, we already have it. So, so what do we have? We have our trigger. Then we check the tag because TLP red and PAP reds are tags that can be attached to attribute. And if this attribute has any of these tags, we use the order, notice, PAP red or TLP red. Then if it is the case, then we stop the execution, meaning that we would, we would prevent the enrichment to happen. If the attribute doesn't have PAP red or TLP red, then the condition is not satisfied, nothing happened, and so the enrichment process is not blocked. All right, so let's see if there are any questions. Uh, okay, pool, it means event from built in. Uh, no, the, the pooling operation here is not from feeds, it's from synchronization of MISP instances. So, not from uh, this, but it's from this. Yes, exactly, as Alex said. No, currently we don't support that for feeds. As I said, if you really need this, let us know and uh, and we'll see how how much the community want that feature integrated and how fast <laughs> you guys want it. So let's go back. So getting started in using workflows. So if you haven't updated your MISP instances since, since August, I guess it's a good time to do. Uh, so update your MISP instance and make sure that all submodules are also updated. 
bah, ce module a mis euh, the different taxonomies, the different galaxies, uh, and obviously if you want to access the whole uh, buffet of uh, action modules that are offered by the MISP enrichment service, make sure to also update your MISP module. So let's see how we build the workflow. So let's see, prevent event publication if the TLP red tag is set. And then we'll do the second point and then we'll do the third one. All right. So let's see how we can do that. Uh, this one. So we want to prevent an event to be publish, published if it has the TLP red tag. All right. So to do that, we go back to our list of triggers. And then we'll take the event publish trigger. We'll edit it. So you can click on this edit associated workflow button. You can see I have a lot of stuff already. So let's get rid of that. Let's take back our trigger and let's see what we have. Uh, actually, I will start it from scratch so that it's better. So what do we want to do? Prevent event publication if we have a TLP tag. So first, let's add a mechanism to prevent the publication. For that, I will take the stop execution module and I will put it on the canvas. Then what else do we want to do? Uh, to block if it's a TLP red tag. So for that, this is about logic. So I'll click on logic and then take the if tag conditional module. So I've connected these two. So now if an event is about to be published, we will run this module, which will check against the event. We'll check if it, this event is tagged with TP red. So now we have, if an event is about to be published and it has the TLP red tag, then we prevent the publication. We save it. And that's it. Now we have the workflow in place. So right now we cannot publish any event with TLP red. That our tag with TLP red. So what is the second point? Second point is send the mail to this user account about potential data leak. Ah. So we need to send the mail. Take send mail, send mail module. And then what? Ah, we don't have a, an output there. So what we need to do to get rid of that link and do it like this. We change the recipient because we want to send it to admin at admin.test. We can further edit the subject and the body by clicking on this button and say something like potential data leak the event uh, and then I don't know event.id uh, was about to be published but has been booked. There we go. This is good. Now we can save. So now if an event is about to be published and it has a TLP red tag, MISP will send a message to this recipient with this subject and uh, body, and then it will stop the execution, so it will prevent the publishing to happen. Good. So what's the third point is to send a notification on Mattermost uh, that the event was published because it's an otherwise. So if the event doesn't have TAP red tag, then send a notification on Mattermost. So for that, we'll take Mattermost. Condition is not satisfied. So if the event doesn't have the TLP red tag attached, and then we just need to fill this out. So to give the host name, the, the, the bot token, the channel ID, and the message template of the event. So we could say something like new event published. And then we could say, for example, this one, this time use event dot 
info to have access to the info field. There we go. And that's it. So now we've built our workflow that would do exactly that. All right. So some consideration to always keep in mind whenever you are working with, with workflows. First one is, uh, I think, a bit obvious that you cannot create execution loop. So for this one, if a user is about to be saved, we send the message to ZMQ, and then the output is connected to the input of this other ZMQ module, where its output is connected to the input of the other ZMQ module, effectively creating a loop. So this is not authorized. You cannot save that. Uh, because imagine if you were able to save that, and it would execute, then MIS would never finish executing that workflow. Uh, but this one is a bit more tricky. And this is what uh, I call recursive workflows. Uh, right now, you can create them. Uh, we already have ideas on how to prevent uh, being able to save these. Uh, but yeah, currently, you can create it, create that. Uh, so really be careful. Uh, what this one does is actually rerunning that workflow over and over again. So let's see. If an event is about to be saved, uh, then we check if it has TLP tag. If it does, then we delete that tag. However, if you delete an, uh, a tag from an event, you effectively save that event back into the database, effectively running that trigger again. But in that case, we check, OK, does this event have a TLP green tag? It has been removed, so it doesn't. So it takes the other path, and this one adds the TLP green tag. So as we are adding a tag, we are saving the event in the database. And whoops, we are back at square one. And there we go. It will go first branch, second branch, for that, and effectively rerunning itself over and over again. So yeah, be mindful. If you modify data, be careful that if that modification may run the workflow or not. It can be dangerous. And last thing that are not allowed, and this is a design choice, uh, is just to make things uh, less confusing, let's say. So you cannot have multiple output connection from a single node. Uh, so in this case, we, we had this example where you could send a mail and stop the execution. But if you call the stop execution module, it actually stop the it actually prevent the execution of that uh, initial event, but it also stop the execution of the whole workflow. So in this case, uh, you wouldn't know if the email would be sent or not. So yeah, it's a bit execution order is not guarantee. Uh, so to avoid having something confusing, what we do is you will link this one and then you would link the output to this one so that you, you make sure that everything stays sequential. Um, yeah, case showing a warning. So you know already now about blocking and non-blocking workflows. Uh, you know about everything about blocking and non-blocking modules. Basically, we only have one blocking module, with, which is the stop execution. A blocking module can stop can stop the, the, the workflow. It can prevent the original action to happen. This is indicated by this red icon. Um, and we have a special case of module called concurrent task. But for that, uh, I will come back to that later. Uh, so let's skip this one. <laughs> now, blueprints. I think this is the interesting part about sharing and collaboration. So in this feature, in the Miss Workflow feature, you can save part of a workflow as a blueprint and then reuse that in another workflow or share it with someone else. Uh, so let's have a look at how it works. 
let's say that you, you want to export that and save it as a blueprint. So to do that, simply select all these nodes. Or if you just want to take, I don't know, this top without the mattermost one, you can also do it. Doesn't really matter. So you select these, you go in blueprint, save blueprint, then you can uh, put a name. Uh, how would we call that? Uh, prevent TLP red, let's say. You can add a description. Doesn't really matter. You can review the content that you are about to save. So one stop execution module, one tag that has one parameter sent, set, uh, the sent mail and the mattermost one. That's fine. You can click submit. And now, if you want to reuse the blueprint, let's say in another workflow, let's open this one. You can go on the blueprint section, scroll a bit, take this one, put it and there we go it restores the entire workflow that uh, workflow sub part that was created uh, so in this case we we have saved how nodes were linked but also the parameters so it's really useful uh, if you want to reuse workflow part and oh not logged out and you also have access to all the blueprint that you have locally so that you can download it so export it and then you can later on uh, share it with someone that can import it in their misp instance or just copy and paste the, the stuff there all right so we have a GitHub repository for that called Miss Workflow Blueprint. Let's have a look. Oops, Miss Workflow Blueprint. Up. So it's a it's a whole GitHub repository. Uh, we we have few few blueprint already defined there. Uh, so if you have a look quickly, we have one that uh, attached TLP clear on attribute that uh, already have the TLP white tag set. So this is a, a way on how you could, for example, uh, uh, attach both TLP clear and TLP white on, on event. Uh, but also it's, it's also a way for you uh, to replace uh, TLP white by TLP clear. Uh, now, what else could you do with these? Uh, can this one is also interesting? We'll see. We'll see that also in the example uh, to disable the IDS flag uh, of some attribute. Uh, another one that can prevent, and this one we already did actually, that can prevent queries on third-party services if an attribute has the PAP uh, red and uh, or PAP or TLP red tag set. All right. Okay. So let's see. Do we have a question? Uh, but multiple imputes are allowed. What? Yes, you can have multiple imputes. Um, this is if you if you have branching, so that you can connect uh, them. So just oops, I closed the chat. Wait, wait, wait. There we go. So. If I go back to this one, uh, let's take this one again. Uh, so in our case, we could do something like this. It would be <laughs> so in this case, you, we would send a message either to by mail if it's still P red or by Mattermost if, if it's not still P red. But in the end, we could just stop the execution. Okay. So. What else do we have on our slides? Data format. Hmm. So you remember we, in this event publish one, we could use some variable there because when a workflow starts, it, it gets some data as input that is being passed on from module to module. 
So far in event publish, obviously the data that is being passed is the event. So this module received the event so, so that it knows how to check against this condition. Uh, and then this one, uh, if you send the mail, if you want to have variable interpolation, then, uh, well, you need this module, this module needs to have data. So now let's have a look at what, what is the data format that is being passed from module to module. And as one would expect, it is uh, the MISP core format. So if you're not familiar with the, the MISP core format, uh, we have a complete RFC uh, that, that describes that, that format. So let me open up GitHub. Oops. Uh, so we have the complete specification of the MISP format, or how we call it the MISP core format. Uh, can have a look. Uh, it is described quite extensively. Um, but for that, if you want something more digest, I refer you to our slide deck that I will paste in the chat called A11 MISP data model. Part of it was shown this morning during the training. Uh, and it, it basically shows you uh, the format for each entity in MISP. So for example, in an event, you have the, the, the JSON representation, so the MISP format for that event. So you can see an event has some meta information, such as the info field, timestamp, and so on. And then the attributes, the object, the event, report, and so on. And you have the same for attributes, you have the same for object. So yeah, I refer you to, to that, to that uh, slide deck if you want to learn more about the, the data format. Uh, so what is being passed from module to module is this MISP core format. And we have few changes, uh, which are not uh, actually, no, these are not changes, these are additions. First of all, we make sure that attributes are always encapsulated in an event or in an object. So if you, if you do an enrichment, you don't do enrichment against an event, you do an enrichment against an attribute. Uh, and so to make things more uh, easy to integrate with, uh, if an attribute is only passed from module to module, it will always be encapsulated in an event or an object. Uh, so that we stay consistent. Uh, and in addition to the standard uh, properties that the MISP core format has, we created uh, these three in addition. So we have the attribute flatten key, the old tags key, and the inherited for tags key. Do I have an example? No, I don't. Uh, so what I, what I mean by actually, I think I do. Yes, I do. Okay, so we'll see, we'll see what, what they stand for. So this is what the MISP format look like. So we have an event, the attribute, the object, and then this attribute flatten key, as I said here. So this attribute flatten is actu contain actually all the attributes that are stored in this uh, list, but also all the attributes that are contained inside object from that list. So the, the flattening means that you take all attributes, put them in the list, and for the object, you just extract all attributes from all these objects and put that, put them in that list as well. That make things like looping and adding condition much easier for you to express. Um, all tag does the same thing. So in all tags, uh, it's the same concept as we saw this morning with the include event tag a parameter in the API. So all tags we, is a key that would contain all the tags that are attached to the attribute, but also all the tags that were attached on the event that gets propagated on the attribute. So that if you need to loop, to loop on all the tags on an attribute, the one that are attached and the one that are propagated from the event, it's easy, it's just in one key. Uh, and for all tags, you have this inherited flag that allows you to say, okay, this tag was inherited from that uh, from that event or it's not inherited and it's actually attached to the attribute okay so now that you know about the the, the misformat uh, 
let's talk a bit about hash path filtering. But for that, I will try to use an example. So let's say, let's see if I have one. Mm, mm, I do. Oops, so for event publish. Let's say that you want to enrich uh, all attributes from an event whenever it is published. For that, you would use the enrich event. There we go. And then you can choose the module for which you, you want to run the enrichment. So if you want to uh, perform DNS enrichment for all attributes, you could do it like this. But now what if you want to do that enrichment, but only for attributes that have, for example, a specific tag? So in this case, what you will think first, you will say, okay, I will add this module, add tag condition, do something like this. Uh -huh. And then if it's a still red, I want to add this, uh, this enrichment. But now you are not really executing this module on attributes that have TLP red set. You are just saying, okay, if I have an attribute that has TLP red, I want to execute this one. But you are not saying, I want to execute this module on all attributes that have a TLP red tag. So to specify that you want to execute a, a module on a subset of the data, you would need to uh, to use what we call, and it's not there, it's not an issue, to what we call module filtering. And you can achieve that by clicking on this small button. So in this interface, you can, <clears throat> you can specify on which element you want this module to be applied. So in this case, uh, you have to provide a selector to your data and then a condition. So to go back to the slide, the slide includes the syntax and how you can use it <coughs> to, uh, to express conditions. Uh, so this is uh, what we call hash path expression. So if you have that, that data set, so a list of users, you have some IDs, the name and surname, uh, if you pass this path expression, so to loop on all elements of the list, and then filter on uh, the element that have the name Fred, so the, the, the first two, and then extract the IDs, then you would have that as a result. So for example, to express the fact that an attribute has the tag TP red, this is the format for an attribute. So you would use the hash path the following. So access the attribute key. Then you see it's a list of attributes. So you have to loop over that list. Say that you want to extract the tag key and then the name on the tag. And actually I'm missing one. See, I'm missing a loop there because you can have multiple tags. And so this one uh, would work. So if I do that, TLP read in this one, if it's valid, then it will take this branch. Otherwise, you take this one. Okay, so let's let's try something. Uh, let's create a fake event for workflow. Let's add uh, one attribute. Um, IP source seems good. <clears throat> and let's add a domain this time. Now is the time where everything doesn't work and I pray that the demo god will be kind with me today. So we have an event, it's not published and I will create a workflow that will add, uh, first let's, let's try make make things simple. It will add a tag. So with this one, I've decided to add a tag on all attributes. 
and I say, I don't know, do I have something custom? Mm. Okay, let's add TLP. Let's say TLP grid. So let's save this one. So whenever an event is about to be published, I will add a tag on, I will add the TLP green tag on all attributes. So let's see if it works. Let's publish it. Event has been published and I have my two tags added. Good. So now let's say that I only want to add a tag on that attribute. To do that, I need to use that module filtering condition. So this is where this attribute flatten comes handy. Because if I had object there, I would not be able to, to access the attributes of the object without having to do something like this. And if I want to apply that on both this uh, list of attributes and the one without object, it will be difficult. So that's why we have this list, which makes things much easier. So now we are looping on all attributes. And I want to say, OK, if my attribute uh, is has the type uh, domain, then I want to apply my tag. So I think that should be correct. Uh -huh. Okay, let's save and let's try. So I need to unpublish my event. Now let's publish it again. Yep. And you can see it only applied it on this uh, domain attribute. Cool. So now you know how, how that how that works. Um, if you need more information about this hash path uh, filtering and so on, you have a built-in uh, uh, helper there. You can click on it. You have the concepts, the terminology, and hash path example that you can use. Additionally, in the repository, the blueprint repository that we have, we have some that are fairly complex. Uh, let's see if I have it. Uh, for example, oh, this one, I remember this one is very cool. Oops. So this one, add and treatment, do it in a concurrent task. And if we check at the tag operation done for this one, you can see it's a very complex hash pass that basically uses information from the enrichment that was done on the fly. Uh, and if it's if the value, the maliciousness is evaluated, uh, is, uh, is lower than a specific value, then only apply the tag. So, yeah. I really invite you to have a look. It's quite interesting to see how you can combine things creatively. OK. Oh. Uh, let's reload because I want to keep what I did. Mm -hmm. There were some questions um, regarding blocking before. Oh, blocking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The... Oh, you are muted again. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Auto mute of the microphone. Yeah. Um, so the thing was about, um, I think Vincinius Min was mentioning should we always put a stop execution block in the oh. workflow? So, sorry, I, I didn't hear it. Should we should we always put a stop execution block in the workflow? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Exactly. Not, not at all. Uh, if you've put a stop execution there, uh, that would prevent the publishing to happen. So let's try. So see, the event is unpublished. If I try to publish it, I can reload. Can reload. See the tag was added, but the event is still not published. That is because we block the publishing. Now, if I remove this one, save it, and publish it again. I have to 
wait a bit. Oh, now it's published because we didn't block the action. So there was another question, right? There were multiple questions. Hmm. Um, I think technically you already showed to Tiago about the possibility of doing expansion. So mm -hmm. as I was mentioning, any miss modules doing expansions can be called from the workflow, uh, which is basically it's again up to your creativity to do whatever you like uh, there. There were your last one. If you just have two seconds, I can check this one. Um, yeah, in the multiple multiple input case, will the block with multiple input wait for all input before executing? No. So once the the block is called, it stops the execution of the entire workflow. Uh, in the case the block multiple input, but the the workflow execution only follow one path. So if you end up in a module, you cannot like end up in this module from another route. Because everything is sequential. And we don't have things like loops and so on defined. It's really, it's really simplistic in the end. You have an entry point, you can define some branching condition, and then you, that's it. Uh, but I, I see a, an interesting comment from, I try it not to butcher your name, from Matt, Matt Jazz that said that it's faster to do it by hand uh, than construct and debug such complex complex hash paths, that is entirely true and not true. Because if you build automation, it means that you want the system to work for you. So in the end, if you take the time to create that hash path, uh, you will invest like, I don't know, let's go over the top 10 minutes. But then you might save one hour or two hours over like uh, uh, multiple days of work. So this is the first thing. The second thing is I am uh, totally aware that it is quite difficult to write this hash path and to write them correctly. See, I even did a mistake in this slide where I forgot to add this uh, small uh, 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 N between a curly brace. So what we want to do to tackle that is when you have to enter that kind of hash path, uh, we will display the interface. Uh, in the interface, the, the data format that is expected. And then you would be able to click, for example, on this key, and it would generate the hash path from that one automatically. So that it's easier for everyone. Uh, you don't need to debug it. Uh, and uh, it's much safer, uh, because otherwise you end up putting mistakes on the slide. Considering adding test to workflow, uh, we are about to see that. We are about to see that. Um, uh, just creating hash, hash path. Um, yes. It's, it's exactly like using uh, uh, JQ. So JQ mm -hmm. is a command line parser for JSON uh, to create the proper uh, hash pass and filtering pass might take a bit of time, but at the end, if you have to process millions of uh, records, you have to do it. So you don't have to do it manually. So it's an advantage. But indeed, we, we are planning to have a kind of tool to uh, uh, expand and do it uh, from the user interface. But until now, for all the workflow that we have seen, indeed, it takes a, a bit of like 10 minutes, like was, Sammy was mentioning, and after what is done. And usually, when you have a hash pass for MISP event, it's very often also the same hash pass that you can use. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to be honest with you, uh, when I mentioned 10 minutes, if I take back this one, the very complex one that we had, where is it? Uh, I will show it from another perspective. The one with hash lookup? Yes. So, no, it wasn't the hash loop, it was the BGP stuff. And if I look, so this is the hash path. So it's pretty complex. This one, it can take a bit of time. Uh, but with the debugging option that you have at your disposal, it makes things much simpler to do, uh, as, well as, as I will show you. Um, but yeah, this one, to be honest, it took me more than five minutes to build it correctly because initially I was missing the one of these loops. Then I was missing one of these dots somewhere. Uh, yeah, so I understand it's quite difficult, but we make it easier for everyone. And it's good to see that we have again this comment because this comment that it is difficult to build them comes up every training. So that means we really need to, to do something about that. Uh, 
So before going about debugging and testing workflows, I just want to mention one last thing. It is the one that I've skipped already, the concurrent task module. So this is a special type of module. Uh, and it allows multiple output, as you can see. I said that you cannot have multiple output, but for this one, you can actually. And this is the only module that allows you to do it. So the idea of this one is you postpone the execution of all the remaining module and they will be run concurrently. So for this execution, you will end up in this concurrent task and then push to the same queue webhook and matter most will happen concurrently. And this also converts a blocking workflow into a non-blocking one. So to give an example, so we are in the event publish one. You can add this tag operation stuff, but what you can also do is to then branch with the concurrent task and then send the mail uh, and then send the message to Matterpost. Like this, oops, oops. And so whatever happened there, uh, it will not prevent the publication because this is run concurrently and it's defer until the end of the action. Uh, see, because it converts a blocking one into a non-blocking one as soon as it reaches this concurrent task module. And the small uh, uh, slide that I skipped about the warning is if you try to stop the execution, uh, it will show you as a warning because as you arrive there, these execute after the workflow completed. Uh, and so there is no point in stopping it because it already has been published because we went from blocking to non-blocking. So this is just a warning say, telling you, well, it's not going to do anything. So if you have to, uh, to do some heavy operation, let's say, uh, let's take back to add a, a webhook. So in this case, we add a tag and then we perform a query against an endpoint. But this, this query will run for every event that are about to be published, which can really slow down your misp instance, as you can imagine. But the best would be to actually do it like this. So that you let your misp publish the event and then you can continue your daily work and on in the background, this webhook call will run as a concurrent task, so like a thread, and it will not block you from uh, anything, and you, it will not block the publication to happen. So this is the advantage of using this concurrent task module. All right, so what option do we have to debug workflows? Uh, yeah, the first one, hmm, interesting, I forgot to compile it because I had another comment there. <laughs> Um, yeah, the first one. Just, just, just the terminology uh, things, mm -hmm. debugging and testing. Uh, there are different there in workflow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends on what you consider testing. For me, testing is like trying a workflow and running it until I achieve the expected result. Uh, for that, I have a slide for that. But it's not like test case where you make sure that the workflow does as, as, as you would expect. It's not really that. Um, so for the debugging and especially to view the execution of a workflow and its outcome, you can have a look at the application logs. Uh, right now, everything, every time a workflow gets executed and it finishes, you will get a log entry. This is extremely verbose and we received many comments saying that it was too verbose. So we are considering phasing this feature out. Uh, maybe put it as a configuration uh, because it's generating too, too many log entries. But the second one, we will probably keep it to store the execution on a dedicated log file. So we, you might have noticed that I switched the debug mode for some of the workflow on and off. This is really what I call live debugging, where if you enable it for a workflow, uh, for each node that are about to be executed, it will send its data to uh, a specific debug URL that you provide. Uh, and then you can view this 
uh, later on or live. So if you want to do offline debugging using this uh, debug URL, you can use uh, the webhook listener uh, Python script that we have created under the tool folder. Uh, if you want to test workflow against sensitive data, I highly advise you to, to use this offline mode. If it's just with test data that you want to try, you can use uh, like request bin or similar website uh, to debug it. So I think it's a good opportunity and idea to show you how that works. So yeah, let's, let's take this one. Let's enable the debugging. Let me bring uh, request bin. Oops, there we go. So this is all the requests that will be uh, arriving. And now let's run this workflow. So I need to unpublish, then publish. Now the publishing job has been queued and the workflow should be executed. And you can see we are receiving the request. Uh, Unfortunately, and this is because of request bin, they are out of order. It's a bit annoying, uh, but basically it starts with the init and then you will have the different node execution and then it's, it's uh, end with the end. So if we took, have a look at init, you see, uh, well, the data that is being passed uh, and some additional information. Then for the exec, you see again, the data that is being passed. Uh, and uh, the parameters, the filter that were set. Remember, we set a filter for the type to be domain. Uh, yeah, so you see, you see this. And the last one tells you about the outcome of that workflow. Uh, so you have all the nodes that were executed. Uh, if there were some blocking nodes or not, if there were some bars that were blocked, and you see a, a summary of that in this interface. Uh, the reason I why I like to use request bin is because you can quickly browse uh, and you have like a, a good visualization of, of all of this. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. If you are developing your own module uh, or you want to try uh, an action module, we also have a stateless execution. So let's, let's give it a try. Uh, I will take MISP. I will go on the list of modules. So this is all the modules that I have locally. And I want to try, um, yeah, let's take the webhook one so that we can immediately have the result on the left side. Let me clean it. Uh, so I have to paste the URL. So this is the URL of request bin. Uh, yeah, and I can put I can put some data. So and with this, I can execute this module with the provided data. If I execute it, I see true, and then I can see the request with the data that was passed. So if you need to, like, if you are developing your module, you want to try it out uh, or to see how a module would behave on the provided data, uh, feel free to, to test it. So once again, to access this interface, you have to, to list all the modules that are available. And when you are viewing one of these modules, you see the details about this module, you can then run a stateless execution. And last but not least, and this is what I was telling you about testing workflows, you can also uh, yeah, provide data and ask the workflow to be run. So let's try that. So let's go back to our workflow. Oops, let's reload. So we have this one. I will get rid of the TLP green tag so that we can see that it executed. I will grab the data that I want to run because this workflow has to, to have input data because when an event is about to be published, we need the data about that event so that we can run it. 
So if I click on run workflow, I can paste the data that will be fed to our workflow, which is basically the event in this case. If I click on run, oops, we have the outcome. We see that it is a success. And if we check our event again, you can see that the tag was created. So if you need to quickly run workflow and so on, especially for publishing and stuff like that, it's really painful to go there and publish it and publish it again. In this case, you just paste the, the data and then run, 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 and you can try, try, try it out. Don't forget to save the workflow every time you do a modification. So yeah, debugging Ocean, we saw many, you can try, you can test the workflow, you can test the module, you can do some live debugging, uh, and you have yeah, this tasteless execution module. Now, probably the most interesting part for some of you, how can you extend that system? So remember I mentioned there are two ways to do it. You can either do it by writing a PHP module, or you can do it by writing a Python module. So for PHP, uh, well, it's under this location. So you have to put your PHP file with the name of your module, and MISP will automatically pick it up. So it's just uh, almost drag and drop. Um, so yeah, we've made the same stem so that it can be easily extended. So it inherits a base module class that have access to a lot of helper function. You can configure them with global variable. Uh, and this is where you will implement like the, the logic of your module. The main benefit that you have in writing them in PHP compared to Python is that it's faster because in Python, it has to do a request against, against the server, the miss module server. And um, yeah, also you can reuse a lot of existing functionalities uh, that, you, that you have. Uh, in, in the MISP source code. So this is what it looks like. Sorry, it's PHP. But basically you define what your module can do and what, what it is. So currently we are viewing a blueprint of an action module that you can just copy paste. So you can define if your module is blocking, if it should be disabled by default, have the name, the description of your module. If you want to have a specific icon for your module, See all modules, they have all have icons. It, it's more visually pleasing to have icons, so you can define it there. Um, yeah, and then you have to implement this function, which is the only function that you need to implement. And uh, yeah, if there are some errors, you can just happen error like this. And it returns either true or false. It returns true if the execution was a success and false if it was not a success. So yeah, if you if you want to to see more example, uh, I advise you to to have a look at uh, other modules. Uh, you you have more than ten examples for which you can inspire. And now for Python, it's really similar actually. And if you have already written some miss module modules, uh, it's almost the same. So we also have created some helper function. Uh, the configuration is also done via variables. And yeah, main benefit is it's easier for most people to write in Python than in PHP. And it has a lot of libraries, especially for integration. For example, Mattermost, once again, it is done uh, via Python. So yeah, this is what it looks like. You define your module configuration. So in this case, it could be like the Mattermost URL, the channel ID, the bot uh, authorization key, you could describe there can say if your module is blocking or not, uh, give some information, meta information about who created the modules, uh, the description of the modules and so on. And the only function that you have to implement is the handler. Uh, so basically what you do, insert your magic here. So yeah, if you need to, to like create a post on Mattermost, this is where you would do it. So let's see, do I have an example, an easy example at hand? Um, action module. Uh, let's see, not almost. Hmm. See, we have 
de Mattermost source name, de bot access token, channel ID, message template. Uh, a function that can be used to create a post on the Mattermost. And you see, it's pretty simplistic. The handler function just get the request, create the post, and yeah, return that it was a success, and that's it. All right, we are almost done with uh, this feature. So some ideas that, that you could do with, uh, in addition to what we saw today. So you could send custom notification when a user join an instance. Uh, the second one you cannot already do, uh, but I think it would be really interesting to have. It's a new trigger that would run every time a log entry is generated. Uh, we just need to be clever on how we run it to avoid like slowing down your misspinsels, but I mean, it could really bring up a lot of other use cases. Uh, another use case, uh, extend the already existing misbehavior to like push correlation on another system. So for example, a graph database, if you want to. Uh, yeah, this is, I think, the most common and the one that we know is the most used is the sanity check to, to block publishing. So if some event, they don't pass uh, sanity checks, so they don't have all the required uh, tags or combination of tags and so on, well, you can stop the publishing of these events. So this is what is currently being developed. Uh, it is to ease the filtering aspect on the, when you, you want to perform additional actions. So I will explain you the, the use case quickly. So let's say that you want to add tags on all uh, attribute of type domain. But let's say that you also want to turn off the IDS flag of these same uh, attributes. So it was domain, yes, uh, equals type. There we go. So for this one, and actually I want to, to, to do it the other way around, sorry. So right now, this modules, I just remove, perfect. This workflow, what it, what it does, when an event is published, it will remove the IDS flag of all attribute of type domain, and then it will add the tag, I just remove, on all attributes uh, that, that are of type domain. But if we wanted to like do something a bit more clever and say, okay, I want to turn off all uh, one uh, and it's two ideas. So right now, this one turns off the ideas flag of all attributes that have the IDS flag set. And if I want to add a tag of on all attributes that got their IDS flag turned off, I cannot do it because this module modified the data. And so I cannot pass the condition onto the next module. So this is one first use case that we, you cannot currently do right now. But the second use case, and I think is easier, you see these two modules, they have the same filtering condition and it's a bit repetitive to do it. So if you, if we had a way to filter the data, uh, to apply a filtering on the data and then to be able to reset the filtering later on, that would be much simpler because you wouldn't have to mod modify these two modules, but you can also be more flexible on what you, what you, uh, on what, uh, on what part of the data you want to apply your module. So this is what is currently being under development. It's two new modules. The first one called filter generic. The second one is called uh, remove filter. Basically, you define a filtering using hash path. You assign a label to this filtering. And so the data that is being passed from module to module is filtered under these labels. And if you want to get rid of one filtering, uh, you can use the remove filter. So in this case, we remove the filter B. And yeah, so all the modules that execute uh, where their data has this filter active, 
well, they will only apply it on the, the filter data. Uh, I hope it was more or less clear. I know this is really difficult and tough to, to understand, and maybe I'm not clear also, it doesn't help. Uh, but the best would be to, to, to like try it out with the module filtering, see the limitation, and then you will understand why this is really useful. So in addition to that, what are we planning to do in the future for that workflow feature? Well, obviously it's to add new modules, so to add new action module. And I guess these action modules, they will be coming from the community. So the Microsoft uh, Teams webhook uh, that, that is coming from the community. And I guess we'll have some other modules coming uh, soon, hopefully. Uh, same for conditional modules. So we, the uh, new module that was created uh, not so long ago, this one was developed because of we had a specific use case, but obviously when we need something, we develop it and then we make it available for everyone. So if other people have needs for a specific logic module, uh, I hope they will also share it with us. Third one is more triggers. Uh, I mentioned to be able to run workflow when a new proposal is created. That is something that we could do. It was mentioned in the chat that we could also have triggers when an event uh, has been created via a feed pool. That would be also an interesting trigger to have. Uh, write mode documentation, prevent a recursion. Remember that uh, recursive workflow that would run itself over and over. This is something that we also want to add. And yeah, I think that's uh, already a lot of tasks to do. So to quickly summarize this very long presentation, um, we designed this, this feature to make it easier for people to integrate and to automate things. If you have already a complete CTI pipeline in place, uh, this feature is not meant for you to replace your CTI pipeline by, by the workflows. It's really not the, the intention. The intention is to make things easier. So if you feel like it would be easier for you to migrate some of your CTI pipeline into this workflow feature, feel free to do it. Uh, but yeah. I think it's just a simple way, hopefully simple, to cheaply create automation with this data. Uh, so we have a small disclaimer saying that it's beta. Uh, yeah, so the feature is unlikely to change, uh, especially the data format. I highly doubt it is likely to change. Uh, but yeah, we are still receiving feedback and sometimes very good feedback about it so that we can create improvement and so on. So keep them coming and uh, let us know if you need something about that feature, new triggers, new modules. Anyway, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, that's, that's it for me. If you have any question, uh, additional questions, things that you want to see and so on, let me know. Uh, I will be monitoring the, the, the chat. Also, if you want to like to, uh, Ah, yeah. Also, if you have unrelated questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, what we can also do is maybe stop the recording so that you are more at ease to ask questions. Um, I will stop the recording. Yes, thank you. <laughs>